tell us a little bit about Druidry from the early days and how it's evolved and how we even have any records since it is an oral tradition. It sure is. Now, the location that I'm currently talking to you from, the Isle of Anglesey, was the ancestral seat or the chief seat of the ancient British Druids. So now you're looking at around about 2,000 years ago. Now, the Druid priest caste at that particular time, they held great political or socio-political sway over the peoples of the British Isles, and indeed the whole of Northern Europe, to an extent that they had become a little bit of a thorn in the side of the Roman Empire. So when Rome was invading the lower portions of the British Isles, they very quickly were aware that the Druids were ruling over the tribal communities of the British Isles. And it seems that at the heart of that was the island of Anglesey that I occupy today. So under the command of one of the Caesars, Suetonius Paulinus, one of the commanders of Rome, was sent directly to Anglesey to destroy the Druid stronghold. So this was in 62 of the Common Era. So we're still going back a fair while into the past. So Suetonius traveled a fair distance from Londinium, current London, our capital city, all the way to the Isle of Anglesey, had to cross mountainous terrains. It wasn't an easy journey for them. And for them to do this journey, which took them several weeks on foot, must have had some kind of modus operandi that had great sway for the Roman Empire. And when they arrived on the shores of the island of Anglesey, they were met by a startling, a startling scene that is viscerally recorded by Tacitus in his account of the Battle of the Menai Straits and the Battle of Mona. It appeared that the women of the island were the first line of defense, and they were known as the Furies, or called the Furies by the Roman armies, brandishing torches. Behind them were the warrior cast, and behind those were the Druids with their arms up into the skies, casting imprecations in the, in the hope that somehow they would stop the Roman invasion. They did not stop the Roman invasion, and Rome eventually conquered Anglesey. But it took 18 years for that entire conquering to occur, if you like. So between Suetonius Paulinus turning back on his heels to retreat back down to southern England, where Boudicca, she was kicking off down there because of potentially what was happening here on the island of Anglesey. So in the native turn at that particular point in time, the island of Anglesey was called, as it still is today in my own current language, Anis Morn. And in Celto-Romano Britain, she was known as Morna, which is a Celto-Romano title for the island. 18 years after the retreat of Suetonius Paulinus, Agricola came and the conquest and I guess the taking and the sublimation of Anglesey was complete. And Druidry kind of settled at that point. Now what we know about Druidry comes mostly from the classical era, from the classical authors, and whether we can trust them or not is I guess a discussion that's up for much debate, but we know that they wrote extensively about the Druids for a number of centuries, and the Caesars in particular were quite, they spoke quite admirably of the qualities of the Druids. And if you look at some of those qualities that the classical authors describe, they are quite inseparable from what people would today describe as shamanic practices. But as to the Druids that survive today, one could ask, well, what lineage or what line do we have to the ancient Druids? Well, what we have is not only our blood, but also the breath of our ancestors that sing to us. And when we consider the fact that when Rome came and when Rome destroyed the Druid stronghold of the island of Anglesey, it appears that at that point in time, it was over that Druidry went to sleep. However, to the memory of the Roman Empire, the modern Druids of the island of Anglesey have a startling message to the echo of those ancestors. We are still here. We didn't go anywhere. We're still here, working as Druids, being Druids, serving our community in the way that we can in the 21st century. And you make an interesting point when you ask, when you stated that Druidry was an oral tradition. So how has it survived? Well, the magic within the oral tradition can be vividly seen recorded in the Welsh Bardic tradition. Now, bear in mind that the language that I speak, so the language I'm speaking to you now, English, is my second language. 
it's not necessarily the language that I'm the most comfortable in speaking. My first language, my mother tongue, is Welsh or Cymraeg. Now, Welsh arose out and evolved and developed from the common Britonic language, which the Druids of 2000 years ago spoke. And as it evolved and developed, it went through our entire culture, our entire islands went through so many crises of identities. But throughout all of those centuries, from the time the common Britonic language gave way to Old Welsh, around about 700 of the common era, right through until like the 16th century, the one glue, the one sticking factor that held together the wisdoms of the past with the coming of modernity was the Welsh Bardic tradition that never went away. It continued in various guises through various evolutions and development, but it was here and it was maintained by the Bards of Britain. And the Bards could be seen as people who caused things to come into being, who created by the power of their voice. And we consider that the bards as an extension of the ancient Druid priest caste, not in an apostolic successive manner, but rather as preservers and guardians of culture and of the magic inherent within culture and how that ties in with the relationship that the people have with the land and how the land speaks to them and the people speak to the land, how the insect world, the bird world, the plant world, the animal kingdom all sing in harmony with one another. We are the keepers and the guardians of that cultural identity, Celtica, I like to call it, this cauldron, this melting pot of a deep, deep ancient magic that has continued to survive, but it hasn't survived in the manner that we deem acceptable for something to survive, for we live in, I guess, an increasingly, well, we've been living in a logocentric world for some centuries where if something isn't written on paper, if something isn't perceived as being tangible, does it have credence? Does it have kudos? And does it have validity? Now, the manner by which the traditions, the wisdoms, and perhaps some of the magic of the old Druidry has reached us in the modern world, it has come to us by this, by the shrine of the lips, by the altars of the tongue. It's come to us by words that have echoed through the centuries. Now, the liturgical components of what the Druids did isn't recorded in the Welsh Bardic tradition, but what is recorded is what was important to people, the cultural symbolisms and the things that identified those people as bards. And a bard is somebody who sings in praise of something. And to us, Druidry today is, is the language of trees. It sings in praise of nature. We are the bridge between the human world and the natural world, a trait, a quality, an attribute that is frequently placed upon and tagged onto the shamanic communities of our beautiful blue planet. And the Druids were not that different. We were the walkers between the worlds, the people who sought the subtle in order to serve the people of their communities. And we continue to do that. Now, we don't necessarily advise and counsel kings, but we are still here. And that is the strongest message that we have for the echo and memory of the Roman Empire. We are mm. still here. Or in my own language, Dani Amar or Hid. Isn't that beautiful? It is beautiful.